when I teach students how to use a bright field microscope, uh, I take about oh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes perhaps, to go through all the features and to have them uh, work with a specimen and work their way up from low magnification to high. Uh, as they go along, I give them a bunch of pointers, and I'm going to share some of those pointers with you now. For starters, when we mount a specimen, we've got to be very careful. There's a particular way of doing it. For one thing, you want to start by giving yourself some working distance. Have some room between the, uh, the stage and the objective lens. Best way to do that is to put the lowest power lens in place because it's the shortest one. Now, I'm going to take the stage off to show you how to mount a slide. Uh, you don't want to do this, of course, unless you want to spend the rest of your day trying to get it back in place. But the uh, slides fit on the stage, on this type of stage, flat, and they're held in place loosely by a spring clip. This particular slide uh, has a label on it, which you might be able to see. We pop it in there, hold it in place, and now we can move it around by using the uh, mechanical uh, controls. Uh, now, that's not all there is to it. This particular slide has a cover slip, and I uh, put the cover slip in the up direction. Now, it kind of makes sense that you would do that because if you move the slide back and forth across the stage, you don't want the cover slip scraping on the bottom and the thing to be uneven. But there's an even more compelling reason for putting the specimen on top. The reason that slides are thick is for mechanical strength. And they've got to hold up, for heaven's sake, and we don't want to break them. The cover slips are extremely thin and sharp and kind of dangerous. Uh, we put the specimen on the top of a slide because when we work our way up into higher magnifications, that objective lens has to get very, very close to the specimen. Uh, it almost touches the specimen. The focal distance is very, very close, particularly with an oil immersion lens. Uh, now, sometimes... We'll work with slides that don't have a label. They don't even have a cover slip. Blood smears, for example, or bacterial smears. And in that case, it's critical that we know which side is up. If the slide's upside down, then you can see perfectly well through this glass slide uh, at low magnification, probably at 40 power, probably at 100 power. You go up to 400, and you're going to go right into the slide and possibly even break the darn thing uh, trying to focus. <clears throat> the other reason for having the specimen up and using a very thin cover slip is that you have very, very little glass between the specimen itself uh, and the objective lens. And if we're using specialized, object, uh, specialized optics or we're trying to match the condenser to the numerical aperture of our lens, uh, we don't want a big, thick hunk of glass getting in our way and distorting the image. Uh, if you wear eyeglasses, and it's just a simple correction, if you have binocular eyepieces, you don't need to uh, wear them at all. Uh, only for astigmatism or some complex correction do you need them. You can take your eyeglasses off and leave the eye cups in place so your peripheral vision doesn't interfere with, with looking through the, uh, the lenses. And the first order of business would be to look at the field of view and just like you would with field glasses, with binoculars, adjust the eye separation, that is the separation of the two oculars or eyepieces. Uh, you want to be able to see a single view, a single field of view with both eyes, just like you would in a pair of binoculars. Some of our, um, some of our uh, eyes are set very far apart. Some are very narrow. Uh, people whose eyes are set fairly close together might have a little trouble with binocular vision and getting a single field of view. In that case, it's, it's especially important that the individual oculars be adjusted. Now, these, this particular binocular eyepiece tube has two oculars that are removable, and both are adjustable. You can take the eyepiece and telescope it by twisting to give it a focal range. And that's important because what we want to do here is focus the microscope and I'm going to go ahead and set this up. I'm going to put it in a working position for myself. Pardon me for being rude. Here we go. I'm going to focus the microscope by looking through just one eye. And there we go. I get on, I'm on the specimen. And now what I do is I look with the other eye, and it's a little off. So I take my 
eyepiece, leaving it in place, and I focus the eyepiece itself. When I do that, I've got the eyepieces matched for both eyes. Now it doesn't matter what objective lens I use, I see the, a nice, clean, crisp, focused image just by focusing on the microscope itself. Now the condenser has to be adjusted as well. If you have an adjustable condenser, uh, which most student microscopes don't, but if you do, uh, make sure it's in the proper position. If the condenser is down away from the stage, uh, you're not going to see much at all. It has an optimum position, usually within a few millimeters of the stage opening. Now I'm going to take mine off. A lot of condensers look differently. Mo most of them are round, and, and, and they do have... All of them have a condenser lens that you can identify. They vary in shapes, sizes, and mounting methods, and so on. Um, the uh, condenser is here, lens, and here's the opening underneath where the light comes in. If we have this thing in bright field mode, then if we open up the condenser nice and wide, we have an opening in the condenser lens that's large and admits a lot of light into the lens itself. If we stop down the aperture diaphragm, that opening becomes very, very small, as in the top illustration here. The size of the aperture corresponds to a difference in a change in the contrast uh, with which we view the specimen. If it's wide open, bright, we see a, tend to see a washed out image. The colors are very true. The colors are beautiful. Uh, but it tends to be a little pale, and details are really hard to see. If we have the thing stopped down fully, we see a lot of detail. And a lot of people who are unfamiliar with using a microscope will do that. They'll stop the condenser way down, and then they can see everything in the field, including eyelashes and spots on the lens and so on. Uh, but the image is distorted. Uh, we don't see details in true form. We see uh, uh, shapes and lines where there aren't any. What we really prefer to do is optimize the angle of light entering the objective lens by placing our uh, aperture diaphragm somewhere in between where we just start to see detail and just before it starts to distort the image. That's the optimization that we need to do with the condenser. Uh, now, before you can adjust the oculars and before you can adjust the, uh, the condenser, you've got to be able to have a target to, to view and to focus on. Uh, so we need to find the target, and when we do, we start at low power. If you really know the specimen well, if you're so familiar, for example, with finding bacteria that have been stained, gram stains, for example, you can go right up to oil immersion probably and, and, and spot what you need to see. But even so, I, I've been doing it for years, and I always start at low power and work my way up. It's just a lot easier, and it, there's a less of a risk that you uh, fail to find your object, let alone uh, uh, break a slide or something. Now, the, uh, if you have something that can be seen readily at low power, big enough so you can recognize it, and it has contrast, then you're fine. Uh, you simply adjust uh, the XY plane, move your slide around until you can spot the, uh, the object uh, at low power. You have to get pretty good depth of focus, so you should probably see it if you're reasonably close to the focal plane. And then you can adjust the contrast, or the, rather the focus, center up the specimen where you want to see it, adjust your contrast, and then move up uh, to the next magnification. Sometimes you can't find the target. Uh, Gram-negative bacteria, for example, stain a very light pink. Uh, at low power, they might look like dirt on a slide if you have the aperture diaphragm turned way up on your, uh, or stopped way down on your condenser. But uh, usually you can't see them at all, uh, and you need to focus on something else. The same is true with living specimens, uh, things that are swimming around, any kind of small object, and especially if they're fairly sparsely distributed, where you can go to a, a field of view and see nothing at all. We need to get into the focal plane first before we can start searching for what we're looking for. One way to do that is to focus on an air bubble. Uh, if you have a, a defective uh, permanent slide mount, and it's got a few bubbles in it, a few spots, a few uh, uh, pieces of matter embedded in the medium, you could focus on something of that sort uh, and get yourself into the focal plane. Another way is to go to the edge of a cover slip and focus on the edge of the cover slip at low power. You'll see a nice crisp line that will either be the top or bottom of the cover slip, 
And if you can, try to adjust the stage so that you're looking at the bottom edge of the cover slip, and that will be the level of your specimen. Uh, another trick that we use, especially in microbiology, is to take a marking pen, diamond marking pen, and put a scratch on the slide. You could probably do that with a razor blade or, or any kind of sharp object, and then focus on the scratch. Uh, with a smear, you can even put a little mark uh, through the smear by using a, an applicator stick or a pen or something to give yourself something to target. Now, when we work up in magnification, <clears throat> first of all, we find our object. And in this case, I'm using a, a stained uh, section of leaf as an example. Uh, and then we center up the target and focus. Now, when we're at 40 power, we don't see a lot of detail. Uh, but um, centered and focused, we can move up in magnification. And chances are, at the higher magnification, where we're looking at a much smaller surface area, uh, we're going to have our specimen in there. And we can once again focus on it. We can center it up. We can optimize lighting and contrast. So if we go from 40 power to 100, and that's all you need, you can stop there, take your measurements, make your observations, and that's it. If you need to go further, you again need to adjust your mechanical stage, get the thing centered up. Again, make minor corrections to the focus. Uh, parfocal doesn't mean that the lenses are perfectly matched. You always have to make some, some changes to the focus. Uh, and then center it up, and then you can move to your next highest objective. In this case, it would be the 40x objective. Now, when you do that, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, you've got to be very careful. Most lower magnification lenses, 40 power, 100 power, uh, are some comfortable distance from the specimen when the specimen comes into focus. Uh, 40 power lens, which gives us 400 power final magnification, is called the high dry lens by a lot of people. It comes very close, dangerously close, to the specimen itself. You can actually, if you're not careful, ram the end of the objective lens right into the specimen. Uh, and so we want to be very careful putting that lens in. Uh, again, you'll have to make minor adjustments to the focus. This time, because a slight movement of the focus can take you right out of the focal plane, we want to use the fine focus only. That also helps protect the objective and the slide from a collision. And then again, center up your specimen, make your observations. If that isn't enough, uh, most microscopes are also equipped with a 100 power lens, or perhaps a 97 or 95. Uh, at that magnification, you get empty magnification, no improvement in resolution at all, unless you use a drop of immersion oil uh, with the lens. Uh, immersion, oil immersion lenses are dedicated for that purpose. They're not worth much without the oil. Regular dry lenses, such as the 40 power I described here, are never used with oil. They're designed strictly to be used in air. You don't want to mix them up. Now, when we focus at high magnification, again, the orientation of the specimen up or down is critical. Uh, if the specimen, for some reason, is on the bottom of the slide, and you try to focus with a high magnification lens, you will have no chance at all. You'll never make it. And every time I teach microbiology, the students do this to me. Somebody will say, I can't focus. I can't find the specimen. I can see it at 100 power, but I can't see it at 400. And I'll look in the microscope at 100 power. There it is. OK, and I'll roll in the 40 power lens. I'll make some fine adjustments to the focus. I'll work with the contrast. God, this is odd. Maybe the lens is dirty. And then I realize, and I take the slide, I glare at the student, and I turn it upside down. Bam, there it is. It's a Easy mistake to make if you've got a, a smear, because uh, the slides tend to reflect the same way up and down. And if you've got a bacterial smear or a blood smear, sometimes it's difficult to tell which side's up. Usually we put a scratch on the bottom of the slide. Then you could feel the scratch and know which way to go. Uh, I was talking about the risk of a collision. This uh, is my 40 power lens here. And there's quite a bit of distance between the slide and the, and the tip of the lens. The specimen is way out of focus right now. If I adjust the stage carefully, I can get the thing. That is just about where it belongs, as in the slide here. You have to be very, very dangerously close uh, to the specimen. And again, if, if the specimen's upside down, 
or you're a little too aggressive with the focus knob, you can ram the objective lens right into the slide, smash it. Prepared slides are expensive. They're three, four, five dollars a piece. Uh, and objective lenses, which might also be damaged in such a collision, could cost anywhere from three to four hundred dollars or more. So we do want to avoid that sort of thing if we can. Uh, when you uh, are trying to find a specimen, even at low magnification, sometimes you get lost. And if you're kind of lost and you're not sure where you are and you're having trouble finding the, the focal plane, there are some tricks. Uh, it, it helps to know where you are. I'm going to take my 100 power lens here and I'm going to lower the stage way down so that everything is out of focus. Now, if I start to raise my stage and want to bring my specimen into focus, the first thing that comes into position, uh, into focus, is the very top of the cover slip. The very first thing in the light path, the closest object to the objective lens is, in fact, the top of the cover slip itself. Uh, we can usually spot the top of a cover slip by the edge, looking at the edge, or perhaps by putting a mark on it. Maybe there's some dust on it. Uh, and then, if we raise the stage further, we're looking at the bottom of the cover slip. Now, if it's a permanent mount, we're right there in the space between slide and cover slip. We should be able to see the specimen. Sometimes with live mounts, with wet mounts, there's liquid in between the cover slip and the slide. And we might be a little too high yet, and we have to raise the stage further. If we go up a little further, now we're focused on the top of the glass slide itself. Specimens should be resting on the top of the slide, and that's almost a guarantee we're going to be in the right focal plane. Raising it further now, and we're looking at the bottom of the slide. You can see scratches on the bottom of the slide, perhaps, uh, maybe a mark. If you use a diamond mark to put a scratch on the bottom of, of a bacterial smear, you'll see that scratch in focus, and then you know you've got to lower the stage and go back up. Uh, if you keep going, uh, and again, you can't do this with a high power lens, but with a low one, if you keep going, you're actually going to be focused on the surface of the condenser lens itself. And it doesn't look right at all. Uh, mine tend to look like a ground glass, frosted glass appearance. And then I know that the student has a stage too high, and we can go ahead and lower it to get back into focus. <coughs> now, having to do deal with this vertical dimension uh, isn't always a disadvantage. There's some neat things we can do with it. Uh, for example, the um, alga spirogyra at very low magnification uh, looks as though it has chloropla chloroplasts in rows that crisscross each other. Thus, the name spirogyra, they tend to spiral along. At low magnification, you might think that they're scattered throughout the cell, uh, crisscrossing each other uh, and making this argyle pattern. Uh, at about 400 power, if you look at a spirogyra filament, the whole thing doesn't come into focus at the same time. If we were have our stage lowered a bit, and we bring it up, and now we're looking at the specimen, when we first, at 400 power, focus on the top of the specimen, we're seeing just the very top of the cell wall resting. This thing is, remember, it's rod-shaped. It has three dimensions, and our focal plane is narrow enough that we can actually focus on the row of chloroplasts that's sitting just below the cell wall surface right on the top. As we focus by bringing the stage up, so we're looking through, we're optically sectioning the specimen, we begin to get other uh, chloroplasts into view, and we discover that, as a matter of fact, as we work through our cell, they're not scattered all the way through the depth of the cell after all, but they're on the edges. And instead of crisscrossing through the cytoplasm, as you might think from looking at low magnifications, we realize that the chloroplasts are arranged in spiral patterns around each cell, actually one spiral pattern. And what looks like two rows crossing is actually the same row spiraling, spiraling underneath itself. So we have, uh, we can get a lot of information by optically sectioning, by taking advantage of the fact that objects have, have three dimensions. Now, I talked about oil immersion microscopy. That's probably one of the trickiest techniques for students with a bright field microscope. Uh, in, a, in a microbiology lab, they have to learn how to use it. Uh, in um, oil immersion, microbiology, by the way, refers to the study of bacteria, observation of bacteria, assays and culture, and so on. 
one of the most important uh, techniques in microbiology is called the Gram stain, uh, where we stain a bacterial smear, heat killed bacteria, and then we can visualize them. Bacteria by themselves, living ones, have very, very little uh, ability to, to produce contrast. They're too small, even if they do have color. At 400 power, bacteria, which might be a few micrometers long and a half a micrometer or so in diameter, uh, can't be seen with sufficient resolution to distinguish individual cells. And in fact, in many cases, they look like they're melted onto the slide, and we think we've done something wrong. Uh, If we put a little drop of immersion oil on top of the bacterial smear and then carefully rotate our oil immersion lens into place to contact the oil, what we do is prevent the light from entering the air from the specimen itself. Instead of going from glass through specimen into air and then back into the objective lens, it actually goes straight through a drop of immersion oil straight into the objective. We've eliminated a couple of refractive surfaces. We've prevented some of the scattering of light that results from the diffraction of different wavelengths. And the oil immersion lens itself is designed so that in the interior, the lens elements are arranged to minimize uh, any distortion caused by such uh, refraction. Uh, Thus, when we use an oil immersion lens, we improve resolution tremendously so that not only do we get an increase in magnification with a 100 power lens or one that's 95 or 97, but we get a tremendous increase in resolution. And what looked like just a melted stick becomes a chain of cells with spores and with details. You can measure their dimensions. Uh, You can do color determinations and so on. Uh, Now, to do oil immersion, we want to place it very carefully. Uh, Very few people really are skilled enough to look at something at low magnification and then flop in the oil immersion lens and bam, bingo, they're looking at something. We have to be very, very careful working up in magnification uh, when we use a long lens like this. What I recommend doing is starting at low magnification, as we do with any kind of viewing. Go up to the high dry, the 40 power lens or 35, whatever you happen to have. Focus and center your specimen. Then move the high dry out of the way and don't put it back. If you uh, have oil on there, and you move your high dry lens in place to look again, not only will you have a distorted vision because of the oil drop, but you'll get oil on your lens and you're going to have to clean it off before it dries. We move the uh, two objectives, um, the one objective out of the way. We put the oil immersion lens in in position to, to be positioned over the specimen and put a generous drop of oil right over the uh, specimen itself. A nice good blob. Roll the oil immersion lens into place. And at this point now, we've got a 50-50 chance of getting into focus. Got to use the fine focus control this time. If you don't use the fine focus, you're for sure going to miss the focal plane completely and probably won't be able to find it again. Uh, And uh, secondly, if we don't use the the fine focus, we're probably going to do some damage to something. Now, the Oil immersion lenses are parfocal with the other lenses, but the focal distance, the focal depth of focus with an oil immersion lens is so tiny uh, that parfocal still means that you might not even see your specimen at all when you rotate in the oil immersion lens. In fact, you probably won't. So what you have to do is roll your fine focus in one direction or the other until the image comes in. Unfortunately, if you're going in the wrong direction, you can't tell. You have no clues to tell you you're going in the wrong direction. It helps to know your microscope. With mine, for example, when I go from the high dry to the oil immersion lens, I know I have to raise the stage. And so I make sure I go in the proper direction in order to bring the specimen into focus. It's a little bit scary because if we overdo it, we're going to ram our objective lens into the specimen and your instructor is going to be very angry with you. What you can do the first time you use one of these things is perhaps have a partner watch the objective lens and make sure you don't get too close. Uh, The um, high dry lens and objective and oil immersion lenses on good microscopes telescope. That is, the end uh, actually compresses a little bit 
Uh, so you've got some leeway there. If you do bump the slide and you push it too far, the end actually pushes down. I don't know if you can see this. And gives you, well, in this case, about an eighth of an inch of, uh, of uh, freedom uh, before you really do some damage. Uh, knowing the microscope helps. Uh, it also helps uh, to know how to focus and know how to recognize when you're going in the right direction. Uh, when you're uh, too far away, you might see nothing at all. You might just see blank. And then you've got to guess. Uh, if you look at your oil immersion lens and you can see a, any kind of reasonable distance between the specimen and the tip of the lens, you know you've got to get closer. Uh, when it's real close to where you're not sure there's any distance at all and you can't see much light above the stage, then you probably are too close and you've got to move it down. When you're looking through the eyepieces and you get close, you'll start to see some color, particularly with a gram stain. Uh, and your object then is to make the color more intense and to make whatever shapes you see smaller. The closer you get to focus, the more intense the coloration and the smaller the shapes until finally when you're in focus, you'll see the lines come in. The focal depth of focus of the oil immersion lens is quite thin. The optimum focus is so thin that a slight nudge of the fine focus either way, and you're going to be blurry. Uh, it, is, it, is really, really, it really takes some fine-tuning and some, some serious practice. Now, sometimes you're going to be trying to, to view something, and there's this obnoxious pattern of dirt somewhere in the light path. Uh, you know, you're thinking, well, I'll just clean everything, but it's not that straightforward. You don't know where that dirt is. Sometimes it's on the condenser. Sometimes it's on the objective lens. Uh, it might be uh, on the eyepieces here. Uh, it might be on the slide itself. Uh, and it might be somewhere internal. There's a prism in here, and it might be a dirty prism, although I don't know how dirt could get in there. Uh, how do you find out which surface to clean? You don't, they seem to have, have very sophisticated coatings on them, we don't want to be rubbing them and, and brushing them and cleaning them all the time. So, well, one trick we can do is when you're looking is just move the stage back and forth. And if your dirt moves at the same time as you move the stage, you know that the, the problem is with the slide itself. You need to clean the bottom or top of the slide. And when I clean any optical surface, unless it's a really stubborn problem, I just breathe on it and rub it off with some lens tissue. Your breath is essentially distilled water, and that's usually enough to, to do the job. If, uh, on the other hand, if it doesn't move, then I suggest the next most easily found spot of dirt would be on the uh, eyepiece itself. And in fact, because you're looking in the oculars all the time and making contact with them, the chances are any kind of obnoxious little dirt is on there. Uh, what you can do then is take each eyepiece and rotate it in the eyepiece tube. Uh, do them both. And if you see the spots that are, in, uh, the, that are the source of the problem moving, rotating, then you know the problem is on the eyepiece. With the, uh, these eyepieces with the eye cups, uh, you can use lens tissue. That's okay. I suggest taking the eye cups off. I've found that they tend to develop a kind of a film on them, and they'll make the situation worse. You can use lens tissue. Another recommended type of cleaning agent is a cotton tip swab, a Q-tip. You do want to make sure it's cotton and not synthetic. Synthetic fibers will, will damage the, the coatings. But if it's pure cotton, you can take your cotton swab and rub the tip there or the eye, eyepiece, get your dust off, and put it back on, and you should be fine. Oh, and don't forget to put your eye cup back. Uh, if it's something on the eyepiece, you clean the outside surface and it's still dirty, then it's time to go to the shop. Uh, we don't want to be taking oculars apart. We certainly don't want to be taking objective lenses apart or anything of that sort. Now, uh, let's suppose that rotating it didn't do it, translational controls didn't do it. What you might do then is, if you have an adjustable condenser, is lower the condenser rack. Just bring it down and bring it up again. And if the spots go out of focus and come back in when you move the condenser, then you know it's simply on the condenser lens itself. Again, you can use uh, lens tissue or a cotton swab to clean the dust off. If you don't have an adjustable condenser, just go ahead and take a look at it, give it a quick, quick wipe. And if the problem still persists, then I would suspect the objective lens itself. 
Now, unfortunately, you can't really do anything. I suppose you could rotate your objective lens, but that doesn't really work. I would simply take the lens off, and in the case of, let's take my high dry off here. There we go. You want to be very careful because this is an expensive lens. It's a very tiny opening here. It has coatings on it, and it has adhesives and so on. Uh, we want to use our breath or a little bit of distilled water if we want. I would not use any kind of solvent. No alcohols, no organics, no cleaning agents from the grocery store, nothing like that. They might damage the coatings, and they might even melt the glues that hold your elements together and will render the objective lens useless. Usually, uh, a little bit of cleanup with a cotton swab or a uh, lens tissue will do it. Uh, if that's not enough, what you can do, perhaps, is use a, uh, a cleaning agent that is specifically designed for microscope objective lenses. And I would ask your dealer to recommend something. Uh, or make your own uh, using a little bit of vinegar. Uh, I use dilute acetic acid, maybe about 1%. Uh, and uh, if you have a stubborn stain or some dried immersion oil on the slide, uh, you can put a drop of cleaning agent on top, let it rest for a minute or so, and then dab it off. Dab, don't scrub. Uh, dab it off. Treat these things as delicate instruments because, in fact, they are. And then it should be as good as new. If uh, all of your efforts fail and you can't get the dirt off, then it's in here somewhere.